Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is March 4th, 2019. We are broadcasting to you live today uh, from the Mormon Stories Podcast studios in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, today we have, uh, every, every episode I say we have a very special guest. This time I mean it. Uh, we really have a very special guest. Today we are interviewing my mother, um, she was born as Nan Parkinson Parkinson. Uh, eventually, when she married my dad, uh, her name was changed to Nan Parkinson DeLynn. And then uh, uh, 30, I don't know, 33-ish years ago, when she married uh, my stepfather, Don McCulloch, her name changed to Nan Parkinson McCulloch. Uh, but my mom and I were talking uh, recently, and we realized that I've done over a 1,000 hours of interviews and never interviewed my mom, or any immediate family member. So it's time to change that. Uh, so um, because we're broadcasting live, we really do welcome any of you who are joining us live uh, to feel free to join in with your questions or comments. I've already had people ask uh, mom to think of some embarrassing stories she can tell about me. Many people want to know, uh, you know about her faith journey. Uh, many people want to hear her observations about what I was like as a, as a Mormon kid growing up. And of course, many of you want to know uh, what it's been like for her um, to see my podcast, uh, you know, uh, emerge and thrive. And then, of course, many of you want to know what her uh, reactions were to my excommunication and my ultimately not being a member of the church anymore. And, um, and so, yeah, there's a lot we could, we could cover, but mostly I just think she's a fascinating and interesting person. So I'm really excited to have her, uh, on the podcast. So without any further ado, uh, Nan Parkinson, Delyn McCulloch, <laughs> welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you, John. How does it feel to be on my it's podcast? Really, really fun. <laughs> A couple, a couple things that are interesting about my mom. One is that she still is sort of a, um, a believer in a sense, and so we'll be talking about her beliefs. But I wouldn't say she's orthodox, so we could talk about that. She's 84 years old. Um, also, she's one of the very few members of my immediate family that have really listened to my podcast. Uh, she's probably been tuning in the longest of any family member and has probably listened to the most episodes over time. So that's kind of fun for me. Anyway, Mom, uh, it's good to have you here. Well, any, it's just real fun to be here. <laughs> any corrections you want to make to my introduction? I don't think so. Okay. Um, a couple other things we'll talk about uh, that are going to be interesting. Uh, mom's, uh, mom's mo uh, you know, her husband, Don McCulloch, uh, he, he is sealed to his first wife who passed away before... He married my mom, so we'll be talking to, to mom about her reflections on, you know, technically being a, a plural wife in heaven. And also we'll talk about um, her her faith journey and uh, kind of how she, how she views her faith in Mormonism uh, in the modern day. So, all right, mom, um, let's just begin. What do you know... Just and, and details aren't super necessary, but what do you know about your your Mormon ancestors? What what can you tell us just about to what extent you have pioneer ancestry that you remember? Well, I didn't ever get to meet my grandparents because they were dead before I was born. Uh, I had two sets of Parkinsons. Um, a Parkinson. My father was a Parkinson, and my mother was a Parkinson. So is that like cousin? No, cousin we, we were stuff? they weren't related. Okay. Uh, in all the genealogy research that we've done, they never tied in the two Parkinsons. Never tied in back in uh, the old country okay. where they came from. England, right? Right. My mother's father was um, a doctor and lived in Logan, so she was born and raised in Logan. And uh, he had four wives. So how many people do you know who... Um, and, and I didn't even know that was a big deal. <laughs> when, 
when when I grew up, I d- I didn't know that 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 was unique because um, I I knew that I knew all about polygamy and all the wives, but I didn't know um, it was so close to uh, I was so close to that generation that my own mother lived with with uh, sister wives and and uh, occasionally I would I would someone would come to the house and uh, I would say who was that and she would say oh that's uh, that's one of my sisters and and I knew that to you know I knew what that meant. Okay, so so your mother was the daughter of a second or third wife? Do you remember? I think she was the first wife. Your mom's Oh, you mom. know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about I'm that. I'm pretty sure she was a third wife, but I'm not, I'm not oh, totally sure. Oh, okay. Um, so, your mo- so your mom uh, was the daughter of a polygamous marriage. Your grandfather was um, in Logan. But you never knew him, right. so he passed away before you yes, were kind of. Yes, yes. Okay. But but I knew I knew his name. It, he was the. What was his name? Former apostle Ezra Taft Benson, the the one where the name originated. Ezra T. Benson. Ezra T. Benson. Okay. Uh-huh. So what was your grandpa's name? Do you remember? Well, it was Ezra. Ezra Taft Benson, but he was not. The president of the church, and he was not the he was the, the the former Ezra T. Benson. He was in Brigham Young's generation, and he was a very strong leader. But we don't know anything much in history about him because he died young. I okay. think he died in his fifties, and he didn't have a, a chance after after coming. West, he didn't have a chance to do too much because he didn't live that long. Okay. Otherwise, I think he was known as a as a, a potential to be a great leader in the church. Okay. So, um, so your your mom was the daughter of, of of a polygamous family. Do you remember her talking about what that was like for her at all? It wasn't. It wasn't anything to talk about because she didn't think it was a problem. She um, she got along well with all her uh, cousins or sisters, <laughs> whatever, whatever they were, and uh, the and I, she did say that but that her father uh, lived uh, with with her mother. Um, well, her name was um, uh, her mother's her gra- her grandmother's name was Edith Benson, and she was the one that was married to to Ezra Taft Benson. Right. And and uh, my mother said that he lived there, and and uh, I got the idea it's because she was the best cook. <laughs> she thought she was the best cook, and that he liked her cooking. And I'm sure that that wasn't. The main reason, but he he did spend more time there. Your your grandpa spent more time with my mother, with your than, mother's mom, than with his other wives. That's right. According to your mom, because she, because her she mom was, was the a best cook. cook. <laughs> okay. Did she ever talk about what it was like? You know, animosity between the no. wives. Or no, any, she never mentioned. Heaven forbid it. any sexual kind of stuff. Oh no. Between. Well, I know one of his wives lived in a hotel, and she was kind of a, uh, she, um, she was kind of different. I don't know if they even had any children. They may have, but um, but my mother's father was a doctor, and my mother was at the age that she could drive him to his patients. And she used to drive him when he was in a horse and buggy. So she would drive the horse and buggy and um, take him to do his rounds in the morning. And uh, then 
when they got the first car in Logan. I think it was one of the first cars in Logan. Then she got to drive him in a, in a car. And she never drove, to my knowledge, in my lifetime. But as a young girl, she drove her father to, to make his rounds. And I used, I used to laugh to myself thinking, I wonder if he went to see all those wives. <laughs> I wonder if that was part of his, the routine in the morning when he went to make his rounds. I'm sure that wasn't the case because he was a very dedicated doctor and very, very responsible. So I'm sure he wasn't just... <laughs> but I, it used to make me kind of sm smile. Okay, so I just Googled, just to make sure we were getting the names right. So your, your mother was named Karma Parkinson, right? Karma Benson Parkinson. And her, it looks like her father was William Brigham Parkinson, and her mother was Edith Benson Parkinson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the Ezra T. must have come somewhere else. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, that, that's, but that's who the physician was, was the William Brigham Parkinson. Okay. And I, I think I remember he studied at Tufts University a little bit. He, in he was he even was in Chicago, yeah. uh, spe specializing in ear, nose, and throat. Right. He went back, and he was he he studied um, at, at the same place that my granddaughter graduated from medical school. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay. So. So your mom would drive her father around to doctor's appointments, and you wonder whether he drove her around, <laughs> drove him around to his various wives. Well, it just occurred to me that he had a lot of business to take care of, and and uh, <laughs> and she was the one that drove him, and it just it just I thought it was funny the thought of of him <laughs> going to see some of his wives. Okay, but for you. Were you ever embarrassed that your mom was a doctor? No. Like growing up, you grew up in Franklin, Idaho, uh -huh. right? Uh huh. You you didn't grow up embarrassed that your mom was the daughter of a polygamist, or no. even that wasn't a challenge to your testimony at all. No, it Why did, not? didn't bother me any in any way because it didn't bother her in any way. It it was not a big deal at that time. Okay. Um. And. Your your mom somehow is related to Ezra Tapp Benson, the prophet, right? Well, she they're cousins. We mother was more closely related to the former Ezra Tapp Benson. Ezra T. Benson. Ezra T. But Benson. But she was still cousins with Ezra Tapp Benson. Yes. So but she we, would have known but, him. Would but she, she have, was more closely related to him than the than the the one who had his name. Sake, the namesake, got Ezra T. So would she have known Ezra Taft Benson, oh, the, sure. the ultimate yeah. Secretary of Agriculture? Oh, yeah. Prophet? He, he, he lived in Whitney, Idaho, I think, and that's just very close to Franklin. And w would she have had any memories of Ezra Taft Benson, what he was like growing up? Yes, uh-huh. What would she and, have said about him? Well, she didn't say anything about him. She said something about his wife. <laughs> What'd she say? Well... I, it's kind of personal. Okay. So, but she did have personal memories of of both. Okay. Both of them. Okay. Anything about your your dad's ancestors you want to say? We've talked about. Well, your mom they a were bit. from Franklin, and their name was also Parkinson. Okay. And they had a large family, and um, um, they they were they were land owners. They. Um, they had farms, and uh, my father grew up as a hard, hard-working man. And later, when he first got married, he wanted to be an attorney. And so he was studying law by correspondence at the time of the Depression. And because of that, he had a large family, and he had to stop, and he didn't get to finish his law degree. But he did go to the University of Utah, I think, for a year or so. And he was an athlete. He ran track, and he, uh, he uh, ran with Creed Heyman, who was a famous athlete in the church. <laughs> a lot of these stories I don't, I don't know if I should tell. You should. You should tell every... <laughs> CD or embarrassing or controversial well, story that comes to um, mind. He he told me personally 
that when he ran track for the University of Utah, he ran with Kurt Heyman. And once he was in a race with him, and he raced up beside my father, and he says, if you don't let me win this race, I'm going to cleat you. And <laughs> that meant they would, he would get kicked in the, in the shin with the cleats. Okay, there's a listener, <laughs> Heather Heyman Hartle, who says that that's her great grandfather? I know, I know people who are related to him, and 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 uh, I, you know, I can't say it's true. I just know I heard it from my father's mouth. And he, I, I think he was probably older and more proficient, and that he didn't like this young man from Franklin, you know, competing with stealing him. his thunder. I, I, it's just a guess. Now you. Uh, You've mentioned your dad is a gentleman farmer. What does that mean? Well, his father was a gentleman far- farmer. Okay, what does that because mean? Because whenever he had a picture taken or, or any anything, he had on a suit with a vest and a hat, and and uh, and he had on um, a, a in in his lapel was a flower, like a carnation. Okay. And he was out in the barnyard, <laughs> standing there in his farm. So he had lots of sons who could do the farm work for him. And the the boys all grew up working very, very hard. Okay. Uh, But I get the sense that your dad, farming didn't become his full-time profession. No, he just worked as a young man, worked hard. And then when he went to college, he went to the University of Utah and he got a block U. I don't know what that means. But he was an athlete, and he uh, studied there for a year or so. And then the Depression came, and he had to stop his law study of law that he was doing um, correspondence, which okay. was very sad for him because he would have been a great lawyer. So he ended up selling insurance. Okay. So anything you want to tell us about your... Well, not only just your parents, but what did Mormonism mean to your grandparents, to your parents. This is, you know, Franklin, Preston, Idaho. This is where Napoleon Dynamite ended up being filmed. This is sort of a little bit north of Logan and Cache Valley, southern Idaho border. This is clearly an area that that the early church leaders would have colonized or established. So what did Mormonism mean to sort of your parents and ancestors in the Franklin-Preston area? What it was it was their life that was the life the life i didn't know anyone who wasn't in the church everyone was a member of the church and uh, my father was very uh, kind of a character he wanted people to come out of sunday school marching because he didn't like them to be visiting making a noise and so he would show them how to he would get up and show them how to march out of, out of sacrament before they went to class so that they would be, they wouldn't make a noise and that they would march like soldiers because he, he, was, he was in the First World, World War and uh, wanted to be a great soldier, but he, he lost his trigger finger in a, in a farming accident, and so he couldn't be on the front lines of World War One. Is that right? Yes, of World War One. So your dad didn't get to did he, he got to go. Your dad fought in World War One. He got to go, but he wasn't on the front lines because his he lost his trigger finger. Okay. And so um That's a blessing. I just saw a movie about World War One and it yeah, was it was nasty atrocious. Mm-hmm. And so he he loved the thought that he was a soldier. And he had pictures taken with his uniform and everything, but he he didn't. Um, you know that was that was the extent of his uh, military career. Did he ever talk about his war experiences? Did you ever feel like he was scarred by the war? No, no, I didn't feel anything of the kind. I just feel like he was on the periphery because he wasn't able to be out there. On the front lines. Okay. Did he serve a mission? Did your dad serve a mission yes. for the church? New York. City. New York. New York mm-hmm. City. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if if he's having people march out of Sunday school, that would give the impression he was a really strict well, kind of uh, Mormon. He he was, but he was funny. 
I mean, he, was, he had a great sense of humor, but he was strict about certain things. You didn't talk in church. Um, you didn't make a noise or a disturbance, and you were polite and things like that he was strict with. But he, he, he was very funny. He had a great sense of humor. Okay. So your parents uh, met. Anything you want to talk about the meeting or getting married? Anything well, they, interesting? Well, they met uh, at a dance, a sorority dance in, in Logan. Now, your mom, Karma, your mom, she, was she one of the first graduates of, of Utah State University well, as a woman? Well, she was one, one of the first women graduates. That's a big deal, right? It was a big deal. And, and there, I had lots of friends from Franklin but only one whose, whose mother went to college, only one that I can remember whose mother went to college. So it was unusual that she went to college. And, and she told me that after she had been two years at the AC... That's the which, Agricultural College. That's right. What Utah State was called before mm-hmm. it changed its name to Utah State University. After she went two years, her father said, that's enough. <laughs> Girls only need two years, <laughs> so you can't go anymore. And she was heartbroken, and so she begged. And she used to she used to beg through her mother. She didn't go directly to her father. We didn't do that in those days. Even I didn't do that with my father. We we went through the mother. The mother was our intermediary, <laughs> and she begged her father to let her continue and graduate from college. And so uh, her mother was able to con- c- convince him that she could graduate from college. So she went two more years and graduated. And it was fun because they went to a, a get-together for all the graduates, the ancient graduates of, of the AC. And there was a man who got up and spoke. And he said that... Um, uh, he was telling about his life now, what what he'd done since he'd been to college, and and he said that he um, he spent a lot of time with his wife, and they did everything together. Uh, they he even mopped the floor with her, and so my mother was was a quiet, ladylike person, and she always gave my father the floor and laughed at his jokes, and she never said anything funny. I I don't remember anything, but I remember this. Um, she got up and she said, well, my husband and I do a lot of things together, but he would never let me wipe the floor with him. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I thought that was, that was cute. Cause she... So when she's fighting to get those extra two years of college, is it because she's a feminist? Is it because she's an intellectual? No, no, no. She was... What would have been her drive to defy her father and get those f- four years of college instead of just two. She she treasured knowledge. She read a lot. She was well read. She treasured knowledge. All her brothers were were doctors and so forth and well educated. And she kind of didn't think it was fair that 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 she didn't get to graduate. And the and the boys did. All the boys did. And uh, her her older sister was just a beautiful woman that played the piano most of the time, and her youngest sister, Edith, was <clears throat> too young to enter into mother's growing up. She was quite a bit younger, so mother was the only. And mother did the, most of the work. She used. To, they had a bathroom downstairs, in on the first floor. And the upstairs is where the, the boys all slept. They had all these boys in their family. And they had to use uh, the chamber pots at night because they didn't want to go downstairs to go to the bathroom. It was too much trouble. And so my, my mother's job was to empty the chamber pots. And that was rough. And I think she figured that, that she did enough work and worked hard enough that she earned she earned a right to to get an education and and do like like her brothers she she i think she had a lot of self esteem she was quiet and unassuming but um she had a sense of fairness and i think that was her thinking 
Okay. So what can you tell us about your parents' marriage? Well, my father was a very strong personality, and um, he, was, he was the leader, and she was perfectly happy, and, and he was fun to be with. And when relatives came to town, they wanted to stay at our house because my father was a lot of fun and told jokes all the time, and it was really fun to be there. And my mother just thoroughly enjoyed it. She was his best she was his best audience. She sat and laughed at his jokes and and uh, just got the biggest kick out of him. So they, they enjoyed each other's. Um, and uh, I, I think they were very, very, very much in love. But they had a rough start because they had a lot of relatives living with them. And, and uh, they had a lot of, they, uh, mother had a, uh, daddy's sister who had a smallpox and the medication left her uh, s- somewhat uh, mentally ill and uh, and this this sister didn't treat mother very good and and so um, it was it was a hardship for her to have to have her living with them newlyweds and uh, as they had their children, she she said when they had their children, she would was helpful because the babies could sit on her lap because all she could do was just sit there in a chair, but she could hold the babies, and so that was that was good. And then then she had uh, other um, other relatives who came and lived with them, and uh, and that was hard in those days, because she had to do the cooking and all, and um, all the work. How many, how many uh, p- children did your parents have? Mother and daddy had six children, three okay. girls and three boys. And, uh, and where are you in the birth order? I was second to youngest. I was the youngest girl, and I had a brother younger than I. Okay. What, what memories do you have of, of the church growing up in your family? Kind of what, t- talk to us about what it's like to be a Mormon in the 1940s and 50s in Franklin, Preston, Idaho. 30s and 40s. 30s and 40s, sorry. 30s and 40s. 40s, sorry. 40s for You were born sure. in 35, right? Yeah. And so I was more in the 40s. Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was just everyone was Mormon and uh, it was everyone's life and everyone lived, ate, drank, and lived for their Mormon religion. Do you remember who the prophet was when you were a girl growing up? Um, David O. McKay was uh, the prophet when I went to college. Um, seems like it was George, George Albert Smith or someone. Mm-hmm. Do you have any memory of the general authorities like visiting or did you know them or... You know, um, would they have ever come into town? Not, not to Franklin. Okay. Franklin was a really, really small little hamlet. It okay. It's called. Um, do you do you have any? Well, before we talk about David O'Kay, would you have gone to primary and young men's, young women's? Did yes, have a different primary. Name? Yes, primary was great. Primary was our social life. Primary was our our life. Do you remember any favorite? Did you have primary songs you'd sing as a kid growing up? Yes. Did they have the same that sort, same sort of thing? Yeah. Do you remember mm-hmm. any favorite primary songs that you loved as a kid? Little Purple Pansies. How did that go? Little purple pansies touched with yellow gold, growing in the garden of the garden old. We are very tiny, but we'll try, 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 just one spot to gladden you and I. All right. <laughs> any others? No, that's enough singing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, did you did your family have like family home evening or regular well, family prayer or scripture we, study? We didn't have family home evening until I got to be a teenager, and okay. then I played the piano and and we did a lot. It it wasn't it wasn't instigated. I don't think till I, till later on. So we didn't really have. Uh, so once I learned to play the piano and and so forth, and we would have, we always had singing around the piano. My father loved to sing, and he was, he 
felt sad that my mother didn't know how to play the piano. Her sisters did, but she didn't. And so he felt sad that uh, she couldn't play for him. So he was, he was glad that I could play um, songs for him to sing because he liked to sing all the time. So we had a lot of music in our home. Okay. Did you, did your family do scripture study? No, we never did. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. I was, was that taught back then? I don't know any of my friends who did scripture study. It just wasn't wasn't common. Did it, you study the scriptures growing up? Read the Book of Mormon? Read the Bible? No, I didn't study the scriptures. I just went to church. Okay. And do you remember was church three hour block or was no it, no okay what was what was the church it was you you went to church and then they let you out for class and that was it it was it was more like uh, well, did you go twice or something in one day or is that well after? in the in the real olden days we went we went back in the in the evening for sacrament meeting in the evening okay you'd go in the morning Sunday school okay start then, take take me on a Sunday so you wake up. Yeah, you go to church. You go to Sunday school in the morning. In the morning, okay. And would you meet with kids your age or? No. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the primary and the young men and young women was during the week. What well, was that called? Mutual or MIA or yeah, what was that uh -huh. called? And then the the primary was during the week, so we didn't. No, the primary was on Sunday. You're saying the mutual was during the week? No, primary wasn't oh, on primary Sunday. Primary and mutual were during the week. Yeah. But Sunday school was Sunday morning. And then at, and, and sacrament meeting were in, in the, uh, was in the afternoon or evening. And did you walk to church? Did you? Yes, I, I walked. I, I was one of those people that walked to church. How long was that walk? Well, seemed like a couple of miles, but maybe it was just one mile. Okay. But it, was, it seemed like a couple of miles to me. And did you like church? Were you bored by yeah. church? No, I liked it. What and did you I like did, about it? I did music. So I what did you do? I, I played the piano. As a teenage girl? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I... Um, like for sacrament meeting or for... Well, later on, when I got older, I played Well, when you played when you were younger, what were and, you playing for? Oh, in church? Yeah, when you were younger. Well, did you play for Sunday school? Did you play for... No. Primary? No, I didn't play in church till I got older. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but you liked church at, as a teenager or as a kid. Yes, I liked church, and I remember one time uh, I had to give a talk, and I was sitting up on the stand, and my mother came up and 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 went like this, and told me to come over, and 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 so I went to see what was wrong, and she said, "Spit out your gum." <laughs> <laughs> she hated me to chew gum. I was a really bad gum, gum chewer. <laughs> so, okay. So um, what else did you love about church? I liked, I liked it. I, I, I just liked, I, I just always liked church. Was it social? Was it cute yeah, it was boys? Social. Cute boys? Was it friends, girlfriends at church? Mm -hmm. It was social. It was social. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I, I. I'm. I'm sure there were other families that did things differently, but um, we. Our my parents lived the gospel principles. They didn't talk about them. You know, we didn't meet together and talk about gospel principles, um, but. Um, but they lived it. They, my father was brutally honest. My mother couldn't tell a lie if her life depended on it. And um, so they lived. Um, they lived gospel principles. Okay. Did you have a sense growing up that this was like God's one true church with exclusive authority? Like how important was these kind of truth claims to you. So did you believe it was God's one true church growing up? Yeah, I thought it was the only church. <laughs> the only church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you, did you believe, like, what were your views of Joseph Smith growing up? I, 
I don't. I don't remember. I, I don't remember having any particular views. Did you kind of like Joseph Smith is my hero kind of thing? Well, no, he was just, he was, church, that part of church was compartmentalized for me. What do you mean? The, the part of the doctrine and the... Um, the doctrine, the theology, the yeah, history? Yeah, I, I, uh, uh-huh. I didn't take it seriously. You didn't take the doctrine or the theology. I mean, or the history I, I seriously. just accepted it. Okay. I didn't take it seriously. I didn't study it or ponder over it or anything like that. So, as a teenage girl, what did you care about? Just teenage things. Like what? Um, having friends. Okay. And I had a lot of friends, and they went to church. But okay. I don't know that they took it very seriously. I, I didn't have any friends that studied the scriptures that I knew of that sat there and read the scriptures, or just pondered or just thought about the, the, the... So what I'm hearing you say is church was the most important thing in everyone's lives, but people <laughs> thought almost nothing about it because <laughs> it was just... Like your framework. It was just, yeah. church is true, Joseph Smith's a prophet, yeah. scriptures are true, why even really bother thinking about them or studying them? This is just, let, now let's just have a happy, healthy life. Maybe I was a fr- frivolous, carefree person, and, and maybe everyone else was different, but I don't Or know. maybe there wasn't the emphasis. I mean, something that I've noticed, for example, someone would think, I used to think that, oh, every successive generation becomes more immoral or becomes less moral and, and, and more uh, liberal with dress or with speech. And then I realized that, you know, when I was walking down BYU and saw the strapless gowns that the, the BYU women in the 50s and 60s would wear as homecoming queens, I realized we've gotten more, more concerned about shoulders and modest dress than... than you know, we were 40 or 50 years ago. In other words, things can get more conservative, not less. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering whether this whole emphasis on scripture study and doctrine and theology, whether that came about later in the 60s and 70s, whereas when you were growing up, Mormonism was the water you swam in, but you didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I didn't. And I, I might it might be my personality. No, but it, I don't I don't get the sense from your siblings that they did either. And I, I wouldn't guess that your family was different than a lot of other families. Well, we had some devout people in our family. Blaine, my brother Blaine. So as a kid, Blaine would have been studying the scriptures all the time. No, no, but he he turned out to be devout. And later, my, that's my point. Yes, is yes. That in the sixties and seventies. And then my my youngest brother, David. Everyone idolized him because of his seriousness about the church and and uh, other things. He was serious and 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 devoted to um, the church. Right, but again, and, that came later, right? Uh, that came later. There was quite a difference in our ages. My a lot of my brothers and sisters were five five years apart. Yeah. Okay. I'm just I. I'm just noticing that, you know, in my upbringing, and this wasn't even from you or dad, it was like seminary, and I was studying every morning before high school, and I was memorizing scriptures, and I had this intense seminary teacher that was, you know, Brother Layton that was teaching me Bruce R. McConkie-like stuff. Well, Bruce R. McConkie's first Mormon doctrine book didn't even come out to the late 50s, early 60s. Now, there's Joseph Fielding Smith or Joseph F. Smith before that. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering whether this sort of heavy emphasis on doctrine and theology and history came later and wasn't as prolific for your generation. I'm just wondering that. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? I think so. Did you have seminary growing up? Did that even exist before high school or during high school? Well, Well, not in my early Years, but in my later years, we had a seminary in, in high school. You attended seminary? In high school. Okay. And what but was it that wasn't like? an early morning thing. It was, it was just a class. 
And even then we didn't take it serious. I was the piano player and I, I played praise to the man every morning because I like to play it. And it's the only song I, I memorized. And so we sang praise to the man every morning. And it was just kind of a, a humorous thing that everybody knew that I'd be playing praise to the man because that was, and that's what we would sing the same song every time, every day. And nowadays, a lot of people who question and doubt the church or leave the church, that's the hymn they hate worst because it, <laughs> because it's kind of, they, they feel like it's worshiping Joseph almost as, as a godlike figure. Did, would that thought have ever crossed any of your minds back then? This song is kind of putting Joseph on too much of a pedestal? No, that, that didn't occur to me. But the one thing that did occur to me is that we did never talk about Savior. And that always bothered me, and it was always evident to me that during my early growing up, the Savior was never discussed, and I never could figure it out. Why don't we ever talk about the Savior? And we didn't. So growing up, there wasn't an emphasis on Jesus. No. Nadine McCombs Hansen, one of uh, my favorite people in the world, she writes, Correlation started in the 1960s. That is when things started getting more strict. And I think that, that's kind of what I was trying to say. Thank you, Nadine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nadine's on our board. She's awesome. Um, and so you're, okay, let me ask you this. Would you have spent any time thinking about the historicity of the Book of Mormon? In other words, like, did the events in the Book of Mormon actually happen? Or was it just, were, were Nephi and Moroni and Mormon and brother of Jared, were they real characters to you that were real historical figures? I think so. Okay. Were, would you, but you didn't spend a lot of time reading the Book of Mormon growing up. No, I, I read it when when I was at church. Okay. And uh, but I didn't. Uh, and it seemed to me that I, I later on in my teenage years that I did read the the entire book, but. It was on one of those programs where, where we were kind of challenged to read, and I, I think I did actually read, but I don't. I don't know that I ever read the Bible. Okay. Um. So, would you have ever thought about whether the Book of Mormon actually happened, whether it was true or not? It didn't I didn't think about it. Okay. What about whether the Book of Abraham was actually true, whether it was a translation or not? I didn't think about that until I got older. Okay. Those things I thought about later. Yeah, we'll later. get to that. Mm -hmm. What about Joseph? Did you did did you grow up believing that Joseph Smith was a polygamist? Or did you just not know? I think I might have known, but I didn't I didn't think about it cuz my own grandfather was a polygamist and I just thought it's the way we did things. Like would you have known any of Joseph's wives? Would you ever ever would you have ever learned about polyandry, which was Joseph no, no, no? Men's I didn't wives. learn any of that that kind of stuff until I uh, was married. So you would have never, as a teen, had the thought, "Whoa, Joseph married fourteen-year-olds," or no, "Whoa, Joseph married no, other men's wives," never. and you wouldn't have known any of his wives. It would have just no, been what? Just, well, just Emma. But you would have still somehow associated him with polygamy. Well, I I didn't think about it. Okay, I knew I knew Brigham had a lot of wives. Okay, but you hadn't you didn't think much about Joseph Smith, but maybe you would have thought vaguely that he had been a polygamist, but but that's all. Yeah, I don't I don't remember what okay. I thought. I don't I don't remember thinking about him having any other wives but Emma. What would you have thought of as a high school kid about um, you know about b black people, African Americans? So you would have been growing up prior to the. Priesthood okay. ban was lifted, right? Yeah, I can honestly say, and I'm a truth teller, I grew up without prejudice. And I don't know if it's because there were no black people in Franklin, Idaho. And I don't remember any black people in our school. Preston, there may have been black people. I didn't know any. Um, I didn't know black people till I was married, and I was totally untouched by prejudice in that regard. Meaning uh, you had positive regard for, absolutely, for people of color. Absolutely. And when I, when, I, when I was first married, we lived in an in integrated neighborhood. 
and it was the most natural thing in the world to have neighbors in the 50s, to have neighbors that were black and friends, close friends, because my husband's boss in the federal government was was a black man, and they were we uh, we loved those people, and we were very close. And sometimes their children would make jokes about uh, about themselves, <laughs> and uh, and I I was never really a party to that um, because um, my I. I, it was a very respectful relationship, not just because he was my husband's boss, but because I, I respected them especially. So as a teen growing up, you're saying you wouldn't have like thought ill of people of color, you wouldn't have condoned racism, you wouldn't have been scared of them. No. You, you just... And do you think your so parents... Far, it was did so your parents f- ever talk about that? No. And it was so far from our lives because we didn't know any black people. So it's like you you couldn't be racist because they weren't around you and you never talked about them. So That's right. <laughs> and 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 then when when we we did know black people, it was unique, and I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to tell okay. my parents that I knew some black people after I was married and that they were friends. So what about? Um, the priesthood ban. As a teenager, do you remember like thinking, "Oh, that's too bad. They can't have the priesthood, or you know, can't get that, it out in the temple." That I, I de- dealt with as a married person. But as a teenager, did you think about that? No, at all? didn't Used even because they weren't around. Didn't even. And occur. the civil rights movement hadn't right. totally happened yet. Yeah. So didn't even occur to me okay. that it was so that it was a problem. It. What about Lamanites? You know, God turning their skin dark because of a curse. What did you think about that? Did you believe that the Native Americans were Lamanites and that they were descendants of Nephi and Lehi and that they had dark skin because of a curse? I don't remember <clears throat> what I thought about that. Again, you, you they weren't around. There probably weren't a lot of Native Americans in Franklin, right? Uh, Indians were people that... that um, my my grandfather raised an Indian boy as a result of the last Indian War. He he raised a a, a young boy um, that was left orphaned because of the war. And I knew that um, was that a war where Mormons killed Native Americans, basically. Right, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know what was the purpose of the war why they had a war. I didn't know anything like that. I just know as a result of the last Indian War, um, my grandfather adopted a young um, Native American boy and raised him. Okay. So you didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the curse and Native Americans and... and I didn't. I was ignorant. I I didn't search out knowledge and I wasn't that curious about it talk about as a teenage girl what acting and drama and road shows and that that sort of stuff meant to you there that was my religion right there okay talk about that is um i from the very very early i like to entertain and i like to um dance and sing play the piano write plays Put on plays. I, I had a play going all the time with my childhood friends. We would meet and leave a message in a in a hollow log somewhere between the two houses, and uh, we had an ongoing. There were three of us, three, um, three friends, and our our the our stories. We made them up as we went along. As we, as we went along, we. We called it plain shows, and we would make up, and, and we had an ongoing show going all the time. And to further the plots of the show, we would leave messages to each other in this hollow log, so we'd kind of get up to speed. And one of, one of uh, there were two girls, and one girl pretended she was the boy. So we had cast of three, 
and we just had an ongoing show going all the time. So I liked to act, I liked to, to sing, dance, write. And so were there road shows back when you were a teenager? And would you have performed in them? Yes, absolutely. Tell I wrote, our listeners what a road show was. A road show was a short play that was, it had a beginning and an end and a punchline, like any other production. And But it was short, and it was supposed to last about 20 minutes. And all the different wards had their own road show. They wrote it themselves. It had to be original. They wrote it, performed it, and the night of presenting the road shows came, and we we would travel with our shows and put the show on, like at Whitney, Fairview, Preston, Franklin. There were several wards in Preston, and uh, and Whitney, and we would would we had a travel schedule, and we would travel and put on our show and take our scenery and wear our costumes and and we would travel and put on the shows at all the different meeting houses in the area and how was how was Mormonism the center of cultural life growing up were there balls were there yes they had know, they had a golden green ball every year and that was really what was that? Really wonderful. That was that was a, a a formal dance, where that everyone looked forward to that because that's the only one we had, <laughs> the golden green ball. Okay, it's like and a then, fancy. Everyone dressed up. Uh huh. Was there live music? There was a queen. Okay. A queen and and um, the two attendants and. Um, was it a stake event or a ward event or what? Ward. It was a ward event. Uh huh. Okay. Each ward had a, a golden its green own ball. golden green ball. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was great. It was wonderful. And was, was there live music or recorded music? Was there a band? Live. Okay. Some kind of a band. Like a swing band, like a Tommy Dorsey so, kind of thing, or no, it wasn't that advanced. Okay. It was one guy played the violin and somebody played the piano and. But people would have danced and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was it was really, really special. What was the um, were there were there like uh, picnics? Were there ward dances? Yes, lots of ward activities, mm-hmm. and they did have ward dances besides the Golden Green Ball, where where they danced. What were the morality standards? Kind of the law of chastity standards for teenagers growing up in Preston. It's pretty strict. So what 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 would, what messages would you have heard about petting or premarital sex or any of that? Was it ever talked about or masturbation even? Was, was that even? Oh, um, masturbation was never discussed. But uh, was there a name for it? Was was there an awareness that that was even happening? No, I don't think there was a name for it at okay. that time. Um, I I think. When we got to be teenagers, then they talked about um, being morally clean. What did that mean? And that meant you didn't pet or... Which meant what? Touch. Touch each other? Yeah. Don't do that? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Did kids do it anyway? I think some of them did. Mormon kids? Mm Mm-hmm. Did they get in trouble? Did they have to not take the sacrament? Well, was there a punishment? Nobody talked about those things. I mean, it wasn't public. It Were there wasn't... worthiness interviews where the bishop would be grilling you about no, no about whether or not you lived the law of chastity? Uh-uh. I didn't get any of that. I didn't get any of that until, you know, later on, like teenage, uh, like up in. More in high school. And then what What was it? Would, your, would your bishop the, interview you and ask you detailed questions? Very, no. I was never asked those detailed questions until I was, like, old enough to be married, or I was married. 
Okay, so in your teen years, there wasn't this no. obsession with no. petting or immorality or premarital sex or masturbation. It, wasn't, it just wasn't discussed. It wasn't really discussed. Maybe. Was that word, did that word even exist, masturbation, when you were in, in your teen years? I don't think so. It, okay. Um, did any kids get pregnant? Like teenage pregnancy, was that a thing? Not where I not where I, you know, lived. Not that you're aware But of. I think there might have been one person in my high school that was, um, that got pregnant. And it was a, a couple that dated for several years. And uh, I, I can only think of one okay. in, in the whole high school. Did they get married? Were, were they shamed? It wasn't discussed. Okay. I mean, we, we could see. Didn't exist. We d we just didn't discuss it. Okay. Was there this idea of modesty that if you show your shoulders or your legs, that that makes boys have dirty thoughts? And not, then... not, not early on, because I remember June Day was the most important day of the year for for uh, in Idaho. And uh, June Day was when we had a carnival come to town. And the, the governor came to town and had special meetings in, in, in the, um, you know, as far as it was celebrating the uh, Idaho Day. And um, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I was asking about modesty and dress oh, and oh, so, shoulders and so legs. So every, every and... year, every year we had to have something special for June Day. And I, I remember... When I was young, a young little girl, maybe preteen, I had a little ruffle thing that went down kind of on the shoulder a little bit. It would come down, and it was because kind of, it was kind of the style elastic that came like this, and it came down a little bit on the shoulders. No one thought anything about it. And I've seen photos taken of you before you were married. And in evening gowns, and your full shoulders, even some cleavage a little bit? No, I don't Well, think. definitely shoulders. Yeah. And nowadays, shoulders, you know, there's this huge obsession, like mm -hmm. the whole, you know, prom or homecoming dress industry, uh -huh. you got to cover the shoulders. Yeah. It seems like that wasn't a thing. Well, in, in high school, the, the gowns were a little more um, fancy, and, uh, and I... I talked about, uh, in my history, I talked about being the, the sweetheart of Preston High. And that was a big deal because I wasn't ever the golden green ball queen or anything like that in Franklin. But when I went to Preston to school, I finally, my senior year, was the sweetheart of Preston High. And, Is that uh, kind of like homecoming queen, kind of? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. There was a special sweetheart ball. And so you were a looker, basically. Is that what you're saying? No, no. There were a lot of girls that there were queens, and and I, I was that was the first time, and I was a senior in high school, and I had all these years where I wasn't a queen. So one time I was the sweetheart, and I remember my my dress. My mother made it with a little jacket, so it could be more formal. And 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 then I, it had straps. It's probably you may have seen that in the yearbook. But it showed your shoulders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying that we got more conservative with dress. We've gotten more conservative with yeah. dress because and morality, right? Mm -hmm. Than we used to. Because Polly, um, Polly, my older sister, I remember she had um, Chi Omega pictures from when she went to college. And 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 the girls were all ta all in a drape they called it, and it came down over the on the shoulders. Yeah, and it was just that's what they wore. So, did you date in high school? Yes. How was that? Good. What things would you do with your dates? They'd come down to Franklin because no one lived in Franklin. <laughs> just <laughs> I lived there, but. Um, They'd come down, and sometimes they would eat dinner with me, or lunch, and um, at the house. 
Mm-hmm. Your mom would cook a meal. Uh huh. Okay. And and we would. Seems like on Sundays, the cars would go by the house, <laughs> and and um, we would sit somewhere and watch the cars go by the house to see who was who was driving by the house. <laughs> Because I lived down on a country road. I didn't live right up in the town. I lived down on a country road. You went down the hill and you went down this country road, and that's where I lived. Okay. So we we watched the cars. Now you lived on a farm, right? Uh huh. Did you farm? Did you were you involved in farming at all? No, I didn't do farm work. My father at that time wasn't doing farm work anymore. But I remember you talking about turnips or potatoes or something. Well, um, we had a harvest, harvest where we, they let us out of school to do farm work, to get the crops in. And we would pick up potatoes, but that was more, more over in Weston and Dayton and some of those places. We, we didn't have any potato farms in, in Preston necessarily that I knew of, but they w- would let us out and we would go to Dayton or one of those places where they had a lot of potato farms. And we would we would do our our uh, work for the harvest, which was two weeks. But I did I did. Uh, there's one thing I did. I taught beets. My father had sugar beets, and there was a knife about like that, with a a big hook on the end. And I would pick up the beets, and put it on my knee and chop the tops off, and then throw the beet in a pile and the, leave the tops. And uh, sometimes I would hit my, I still have scars on my leg where with that big hook would go into my leg through my clothes because the beets were heavy. They were large, and they were covered with mud, heavy. And they, it was, that was a big job. But usually, I know my father hired um, um, people who crews of, of, of people who who came in to to get work. They they came in to find work. And usually they were American Indian, I think. Okay. And they would come and, and do the farm, you know, the stuff like that. Okay. Because I, I couldn't do that all that myself. So, you know? so you're saying a lot of the farm workers in Franklin, Franklin. Preston were Native Americans? Yeah, the, some of the farm workers. <laughs> kind of like, uh, you know, Latin Americans would be today in many of the farms. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. It's fair to say kind of lower lower class, lower socioeconomic status people were the workers on the farms? Right. And I, w- I was told that one of the, the workers in one of my father's fields um, had a baby and then just went back to work. Like work, have the baby go right back to work. She just went over to the side and had the baby, and oh my then gosh, put it on her back and and kept working. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And awful. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. um, okay, you would have been born right in the middle of the Great Depression, uh, thirty-five, right? Mm-hmm. Do you remember anything about the Great Depression? I mean, by the time you were five, World War five or six, World War Two would have broken out. Right. So I'm not guessing you would have a lot of memories of the Great Depression, right? Well, there were a lot of rationed things that were rationed because of the war rationings. Mm-hmm. Um, sugar. Couldn't get sugar. We, the, we couldn't get a lot of things like that. And I remember the, the rule at my house was you could only use three squares of toilet paper. That, was, that came down from my father. Toilet paper was hard to get. When okay. you had a large family. So okay. three squares, the three square rule <laughs> okay. was firm. All right. <laughs> um, and you would have, what year would you have graduated high school? One of our listeners is asking, this is Cheryl. Hey, Cheryl. Cheryl wants to know what year you graduated from high school. 50, so let's see. 53. What? 53. 53. And it was the Preston Indians, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So thir- you were born in thirty-five, so fifty-three. You would have been eighteen. That makes sense. Okay. And you were a cheerleader at Preston High. 
Yeah, that's what did an, that mean to be a cheerleader? That's another thing I I didn't get. Um, I I wanted to be a cheerleader more than anything. It was just a dream, and I tried out like when I was a sophomore, and I didn't make it. So I just thought, oh. And I tried out for the marching corps, and I didn't make that, and I was just heartbroken. And um, then later my mother said she was glad I didn't make it because my dad didn't like the uniforms. He didn't like the scanty uniforms. The cheerleaders and flag twirlers wore scanty uniforms. But they were still all Mormon, right? Yeah. Okay. But they weren't. their father wasn't as strict, but my father was more strict with what you wore. Any stories you want to tell about your dad being strict religiously? Well, um, uh, when well, let, to finish this other story, when I got to be a senior, there was a girlfriend that I had who lived in a hotel up in Preston. She lived in Preston in a hotel. They really ran the hotel, and they lived in one of the apartments. And she asked me to try out with her to be a cheerleader. So when I was a senior, everything came together for me when I was a senior. I was the sweetheart of Preston High, and I, I, I became a cheerleader. And it was fun because the, the, the person I dated, the boy I dated, was the star of the basketball team. Okay, so this is Delisle Condi, right? Yes. Okay, so you started dating Delisle your I, senior year? No, I dated him before that. And what was, he, what was his status and what was he like? Wait a minute, I was t I was on another story, and I wanted to hurry Oh, go ahead, it. okay. Well, um, you said you, D Delisle, you were dating the... Yeah, but before that, I was finishing the, the story about the cheerleading. Okay. Oh, that, that was just my heart's desire. Okay. And so I made cheerleader at my senior year. I made cheerleader, and it was just so convenient because I was dating Delisle, who was a star of the basketball team. And that was so much fun to be a cheerleader at that time. I loved that. I loved being a cheerleader. It was so much fun. And, uh, um, yes, I, I dated Delisle. I, I dated a couple of other boys, a little uh, older boys. But then they would move on. They would graduate from high school and move on. Um, and uh, Delau was always my age. We were always in the same age, but he didn't. He didn't ask me to go out till um, I had I had another boyfriend when I was um, well. The, I had one when I was a freshman, and then he graduated. Then I had one when I was a sophomore, and he graduated. And uh, then I I got serious about Delau. We were always friends. But then we, we were kind of steady dating at that time. And he went on to become a star basketball player at the University of Utah, He was right? a star basketball player in, in high school. He made, he made all, he, he was the all-star. He was, there were like three nationally known basketball players, and he was one of them. And he went on to play at the University of Utah, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I don't know why I went to the BYU, and so we could never get together. We were, like, engaged. I was wearing a ring and everything, and we just never get to, got together because I was at BYU, and he was, um, he was at the U. And um, so I thought, well, that's stupid. I, I, I should go to the U. And so I had, I had been to the U, I had been to BYU, and then I went, one year I went to Utah State, and then I um, took the exams and everything to go to the University of Utah so that we could both be at the same school, which I should have done sooner. And uh, I got accepted at the University of Utah, and I was really excited about that. And... I was, you know, we, I, Dila was a wonderful person. He was a scholar. He was a, um, he had a family of, of uh, attorneys and doctors. He had a doc brother who was a doctor. He had 
His father was an attorney, his brother was an attorney, and he wanted to be an attorney. And um, so he just happened to play basketball. <laughs> okay, so so by it seems like by your senior year, you're gaining a lot of social status. You're popular, you're the cheerleader, you're dating the star of the basketball team. Your parents were kind of, you know, prominent in the area or, you know, at least to some degree. Um, and by then, Ezra Tapp Benson, who is your mother's cousin, was probably going to be serving in the Eisenhower administration, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot going for you. Mm -hmm. um, what, how in the world did you end up with my dad? <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you're not near the one you love, you love the one you're near. <laughs> love the one you're with. Is that, <laughs> when you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, so what um, happened? So, Well, my, my sister um, was pregnant with, uh, and, and sick and threatening to lose the baby. This is Polly mm -hmm. Beatty. She had two children, but she couldn't have a third one. She just couldn't carry them because she was too sick. And so she was struggling to k keep this baby. And so I was in school at the, at the Utah State at the time. And I volunteered to go try to help her. Because my mother would, wasn't able to go. She was older at that time, and she w wasn't able to go help her. How could you leave school, though, if you're in the middle of school? That's what we did. We somebody needed to go, and my mother wasn't able to, so I left school in the middle of the, in the you know, in in the middle of the year, I left school and went to California to help my sister, and I stayed there. And um, eventually, she lost the baby anyway. But I I was there trying to help. I was cooking and taking care of the two children. and uh, This would have been Kathy and Joan, right? Mm-hmm. Little girls. Right. And uh, and I was engaged all that time. To Delisle Condi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Delisle Condi. And so we had planned to get married as soon as I got home from um, California. So my mother went ahead. She She planned a... I think, yeah, she planned a what they called a trousseau tea. It's it's a like like a shower. Only you, the parents, give it to you. A trousseau tea is what they called it. And uh, when I was taking care of my sister, they introduced me. The husband, Jim. My brother-in-law introduced me to a young man in the ward, and he asked him if he would take care of me because I was down there and show me a good time and, and take care of me because I was there working, and they wanted me to have some downtime where I would, I would have, have some. Have some fun. Yeah. And this is what city in California? San Pedro. San Pedro, which is in the Bay Area, right? Is that right? Is it Northern no, California no, or Southern California? It, it's, it was closer to Long Beach. Okay, Southern California. Yeah. Okay. And so I was working my head off, and I was having a social life with a young man named Dave DeLynn. David Joel DeLynn. Mm -hmm. So that's who Uncle Jim introduced you to. Yes, and asked him to take care of me and help me have a good time because I was working hard. And, and this so, would have been in the mid fifties, right? Mm -hmm. Mid nineteen fifties. Late late fifties. Late fifties. Mm -hmm. And so this um, is Elvis. Elvis is popular. Poodle dresses, right? Is that? Mm -hmm. Is this Greece time? Like when, when when we think of Greece? No, that was was Greece came later. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was early, 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 um, and so I uh, I got to know Dave. And he was a lot of fun, and he um, was, at the time, was, was uh, 
was what was a practicing Mormon. And I don't think he had always been, but at this particular time, he was. And so he, someone had gotten him interested in going back to church, cause he, and he was in the Coast Guard. So he was in the Coast Guard, and on, on his days off and Sundays, he, he would be involved in church activities. Uh, just as a quick side note, I'm, I'm hoping to interview my father uh, later. So, Dad, I hope you're listening to this, and I hope you'll come on. Uh, I'll just, you know, a little bit about my dad. My understanding is he was born to, to Preston Alvaro de Lynn in Salt Lake City. Um, my grandfather, Preston, was not educated. Uh, I get the sense that he did a lot of menial labor. Um, but my dad was went to South High School, which doesn't even exist now. There's a West and the East in Salt Lake City, but there was a South back then. And he didn't finish high school. He would have left home, I don't know, at age 15, right? Would have had a very rough upbringing. Um, and yeah, he ended up working in the Merchant Marines during no, the Korean no. War. No, that was Jim. Uh, Dave was in the Coast Guard. For, for the Korean War? Dave was in the Coast Guard when I met him. Right. I think he might have served in the Merchant Marines prior to the Coast Guard. I don't think so. That was Jim. Okay. Well, okay. anyway, he ends up in the Coast Guard, but he definitely had a rougher childhood. Is yeah. that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Didn't graduate from high school. Yeah, because his didn't his, go to didn't. His mother died as a child. His mother died when he was one years old. Two years old. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and uh, his his fa father remarried, and she was a good woman. But it was it was not a real happy um, life. He didn't have a real happy life, but he, you know, she was a good woman, she was a good cook, and took care of him. And, and so his time in the church would have been spotty during those teen years. Right. But definitely, probably wasn't refined and educated like Delisle. Is that fair to say? Right. He Delisle had uh, every advantage. And so my dad was kind of scrappy. So how would you describe well, dad a little more? Actually, he was he was kind of a schmoozer. <laughs> a, sh a schmoozer. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, he just kind of fit in wherever he he wanted to. He he played the piano by ear, which was fun. He could play, um, and um, we liked to sing together. And he'd play the piano, and and we'd sing. And um, he was, and when I, the reason I, I say he was a smoother is because he was very friendly. And um, one of his best friends was an old lady uh, in the ward there, and that, she's the one that got him to go back to church. But he was, he, he was kind of um, nice to everybody and, and, uh, and a lot of fun and, so I would say he um, he was just uh, fun to be with. And you know when you're when you're on this sort of golden track of marrying a prominent you know basketball star, college attendee guy, Delio Condi, your parents want you to marry this guy. It's almost like a a social status thing. What did was it just that you were far away from Delisle and and so you were lonely, or was it that that you sensed something special in my dad and Dave that you didn't have with Delisle that he met a need that Delisle didn't? Do you have a way to kind of describe what what made you kind of fall for dad and and cancel the engagement with Delisle? Well, I I think it was because. Um it was new, the newness of it. Um, and and I, I had that with every boy I ever dated. There was a period when the newness was there and it was exciting and, and that sort of thing. And um, I, I think if I had, I, I remember thinking, I wonder about why my parents don't tell me um, to wait 
um, because I was very obedient and I would have listened to them when I um, met Dave and when it, when it was time for me to go home after being down there in San Pedro, he took me to the station and, and uh, gave me his dog tags and um, told me he was in love with me. I don't know if he told me he wanted to marry me at that time, but it, it seemed like it. But I was going home, and I already my mother had already planned this trousseau tea where they, they come and like a shower for me. And uh, so, so when he, he, you know, he did that, then I started thinking, well, this is pretty exciting, you know. And so I, I, I went back and I had the newness of this relationship on, on my mind and uh, the excitement during the ex this exciting period of, of, of knowing this, this young man that was, that was very um, different than any, any one I'd ever dated. He was different and he was um, a lot of fun and he liked to dance and he liked to sing and, and we did a lot of things together and uh, it was fun. And so when I went home, I went right to this trousseau tea where they bring, come and bring presents and, and no one knew who I was marrying. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they just assumed it was because of De Delisle, which, which it was. But in the back of my mind, in the back of my mind, I, I had just had somebody say they loved me and wanted to marry me in, uh, in San Pedro. And I, I, I still, I, I was confused. Okay, and how did, how did your parents feel uh, when you told them you, you wanted to dump Delisle and marry Dad? I don't think, I think they were worried but they didn't. They didn't tell me not to, or they didn't warn me to. Why? Why didn't I wait and go back to college another year? And uh, so they didn't object. I got the sense they were kind of annoyed or angry. Well, they no, they didn't show that they they were worried. Let's say they were just worried. Okay. Because my my I remember uh, D Dave realized that I was just about to get married, and so he called and said he was coming to Franklin. And I remember my father told him not to come, and he came anyway. Okay. So so my dad was charming, charismatic, and kind of like bold and determined. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. So yeah. he came anyway. How, how did your parents receive my dad when he shows up? Well, they, liked, up they to... liked him, but they liked him, but they... Um, they were a little worried. Yeah, because Delisle again came from a, a, a prestigious or a well, uh, a higher society family. Well, not higher than mine, but higher than my dad, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it was mm. comparable social station to your to your family, but certainly higher than my dad's family. Delisle was in college. Dad wasn't. Um, so I'm just, you know, it's kind of like that. I, I would just imagine your parents would like, who is this kid? Who are his parents? What's yeah. his background? Mm -hmm. They were worried. Yeah. They were worried. And, and, uh, and like when, when they, when Dave called and said he was coming and my father said, don't come. And they came anyway. Okay. But, he, but dad kind of charmed him. They, they yeah. liked him. Mm -hmm. They liked him. They always liked him. And so they gave. They gave him their blessing. Well, not right, right at first, but we spent a few days together. They were going on a trip to New Orleans, and uh, they left me for one day. They left me alone, but uh, you know we, you know they explained they trusted us and that would, and, and they they had to leave on the trip. And then I went down to Diane and Lee's. That's your your sister Diane. And then Logan. Okay. And uh, and so um, then Dave had to get back because he only had the weekend. 
off from the Coast Guard. You usually don't get time off when you're in a full-time okay. active duty. Okay. Yeah. So he went back, and, and, I, and I, I had this dilemma that I had to choose. And it, it, was, it was a hard, hard, hard choice. Because Delal had stood the test of time, and we had, had dated for several years. Several years we had dated steadily for about four years. And um, we, um, I think we were well-suited, and, and we had a great relationship. But suddenly there was this, this other person that comes into the picture, and he said he loved me and wanted to marry me, and... And um, I just, I felt like I had to, I had to make a decision because it seemed like every summer I would go away to Zion and work, Zion National Park, and I would come back with a boyfriend. And, and so he, he told my mother that was okay, he'd wait. Every, every year I would go and I would come back and I had a boyfriend each year that I went there and worked for the summer. And he said that was okay, that he would wait for me. Delisle or dead? Delisle. Okay. So here this happens again, and it was kind of embarrassing to me that, that, that I, I would put him through that, you know, because I felt like, well, that's, it's just not right. I've got to make a decision. So I felt a great deal of pressure to make the decision. And how did you decide to go with that? I did everything. I prayed. <laughs> I I did everything I could, but I didn't have any adults there to to advise me. My parents had had left for for New Orleans and I I I didn't have them. And I had my sister Diane and Lee and uh, they didn't know what to tell me. So I made the most difficult decision of my lifetime was I had two men that wanted to marry me, and I didn't know which one to choose. I really didn't. So how did Dad win? I don't know. Was it that Dad came and Delisle stayed in Salt Lake? Did Delisle get a sense that his status was being threatened, and so well, he, he he came down, you know, up from Salt, you know, whatever down from Salt Lake, and tried to keep you as his girl? Was there any urgency on Delisle's part? Did well, Delisle just... Delisle came to um, to Logan. That's what happened. He came to Logan, and. Uh, we just kind of discussed the dilemma. We discussed the dilemma. And later on, when I saw Delala after I had married Dave, he said that he should have punched Dave in the nose. <laughs> he said he always had regretted that he didn't punch Dave in the nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he ended up, it's kind of like you snooze, you lose. It seems like Delala kind of snoozed a little bit. Well, uh, Delala kind of was confident that I'd done it before, I had other boyfriends when I went away, and I had to go through this stage of my life. I was just a young girl dating, and he, he was serious sooner than I was. And so he just figured, oh, well, is she worth waiting for? I think so, so I'll, I'll wait. And so that's what he told my, my mother. But, but when I talked to him after... After it all happened, he said, he shouldn't have been so. <laughs> Delisle, you, you snoozed and you lost. I'm sorry. Uh, he's not alive <laughs> anymore, but I, I think one of his grandsons listens to Mormon stories. So, <laughs> All right. But, he, uh, but he, was, he, was a, he was a perfect, you know, he played the trumpet. He played basketball. He, he was good at everything. He was. He became an attorney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was secure. Very secure, and uh, and Dave ha had the ability to do all of that, but he just hadn't had the opportunity. Right. So, so I I figured I was kind of like uh, 
that I felt like if he married the right person, he would turn out to be a great man. <laughs> so I kind of thought, well, maybe I could help him. So in a way, teenagers kind of think that they're, they're important. How old were you when you married Dad? 20. Okay. And I remember you telling me that once, that if you had married Delisle, Delisle would have been great with or yeah. without you. Yeah. But with Dad, with, with your addition, you could have helped Dad be great, and then you would have felt more like you were a part of something. Is that... Sort true? of. Well, well, well that, that I, I, I felt that, it, that he would be great if he married somebody that was devoted to the church and and could help him i i i think that's a teenage way of thinking yeah girls think cuz don said when one of his daughters wanted to date this guy out of the prison cuz she thought she could help him and that kind of reminded me you know you you think that you have more power than you do right so how'd you let Delisle know? How did I let him know? That he lost. I, I, I just, he came to the house and I told him. And it was really hard. What was that like? Terrible. It was very painful. And did you wonder if you were making the wrong decision? Oh, sure. And I wondered for quite a few years. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't go away. Something like that doesn't just go away. You, you struggle with it for a long time. So were you getting a little bit emotional when you were thinking about Delisle and telling him goodbye? Just now? Yeah. No, okay. but I, 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 am, I am emphasizing that it was very difficult. Okay, but you still went with that. Because we had a lot of history together. We yeah. had several years of, of dating. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you chose dad. How, how, the courtship wasn't long, as I understand it. No. No. Um, I don't remember all the details about, about that, but, um, but Dave was, had to go back to the Coast Guard. And so I, I you know, went ahead preparing to get married. And didn't you guys elope? No. Uh-uh. My parents drove me to St. George, and we were married in the St. George. St. George Temple. Uh huh. Why St. George? Why not Logan Temple? Because we met Dave, and then I went back with him. So he was coming from California, mm-hmm. and you, so your parents drove you down to St. George. Mm-hmm. So who attended the wedding? My parents. Who else? That's it. Okay, that's kind of a small wedding, right? Yeah. Like you, I would nowadays you have your siblings yeah. there, aunts and uncles and yeah. cousins. Well, this was we since he was in the Coast Guard, and I felt like, you know, if I'm going to all this trauma of breaking up and everything, I, I don't I don't want to go through this anymore. I don't want to go away and get another boyfriend and come back. And, <laughs> and, and I don't want to do that anymore. I think it's time that I made some sort of a de- decision. And so what I should have done if I'd had parents there to advise me was go back to school and think it over. But I didn't. I decided it was, I, I wanted to make, make it no, there's, you can't turn back. <laughs> This is the decision I've made. And that was the decision I came up with. Just to get married in St. Well, George? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't frivolous. I mean, I was serious about it. It wasn't frivolous. It wasn't, I mean, it sounds like it, the way I'm describing it, but it, but it wasn't that way. It was, it was more, um, you know, this is time that I, that I make this decision. Would you say you loved Dad when you married him? Yes, I think so. What did you love about him, other than you said he was fun and entertaining and charming? You sang and played music together. Yeah, and I think I think he had a lot of potential. Meaning what? Just uh, he had he just had a lot of potential. 
He was articulate, very articulate. And uh, I thought he would, uh, I thought he, he would turn out really well. What did you love about him? How did he make you feel? Well, I, I don't know how to, what to say. I just, I don't, I don't remember all the details. Okay. But you loved but him. But I thought he, I thought I loved him. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought that he had the potential to be a great man. I remember one of one of our friends said he prayed like an apostle. Yeah, how did you perceive him <laughs> religiously? His I I thought because this friend of ours said he prayed like an apostle, and I kind of could see him that he could go far in the church because he was um, he was uh, kind of devoted to to. Uh, getting the work done, you know, that sort of thing. He was, he was devoted, and he seemed to, have, to have, have found a testimony at that time. And was that important to you? Yeah. So he seemed to have a strong testimony to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just thought he could turn out to be somebody really, you know, he hadn't had the opportunity, the opportunities that, that the people I grew up with had. Okay. And uh, and it just seemed like he he had the, all the potential in the world, and it, he just needed somebody to believe in him and, and help him. Okay, so you got married in the St. George Temple what year? <laughs> I don't know. What what year was Gina born? I wonder if it was 55. When, when were you? you Gina were, would be 13 years older than me. I was born in 69. So Gina would have been born in 50, 50, 55, I think. We were married and Gina was born in 56. In 56. Okay, so you're, you were married in 55. Gina was born in 56. Yeah, a year later. Okay. And now we're going to just cover a whole bunch of time in a very small amount of time. So <laughs> really quickly, what did you think of the temple ceremony? When you would have gone through the temple, was there a movie when you first went through the temple, or would it have been actors? Um, Your endowments for the first time. Would your mom have gone through with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And would, your, would there have been a movie in the late 50s, or would there have been I, actors? I, I don't remember the ceremony at that time. I don't remember, but, but generally we had uh, a movie, and there were two different versions of it. And so the, you know, the stuff that they've taken out, like the penalties and the, you know, the, the violent Masonic stuff, did, did that, and also the, the women's stuff, where the women's veiling their faces, when they're coveting to their oh, husbands. We, ha we had all that. And how did that strike you at the time? Well, I thought it was kind of weird. Um, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't real comfortable with it, but it was okay. So it was weird, but not enough to, yeah. to be troubling to you. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, Mormon Stories listeners, we are interviewing Nan Parkinson, uh, Delyn McCulloch, for, for uh, simplicity's sake. This is my mom. So far, we've covered her early years growing up in Preston and Franklin, her high school years, and her marrying my dad. We're going to take a short break. Um, we're going to grab a quick bite to eat and... Uh, we're going to rebroadcast in about 15 minutes and we're going to get into kind of her life uh, and my upbringing and then talk about how her faith has evolved, her reactions to my to Mormon stories, uh, her faith evolution, my excommunication. We're going to cover all that. So uh, thank you for joining us so far. Forgive us for the break and join us in about 15 or 20 minutes where we get into the good stuff, uh, more of the good stuff. <laughs> with, with my mom, Nan Parkinson McCulloch. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.